It's Wednesday night, and we're studying through the Old Testament. I've actually learned a lot about studying through the Old Testament since we've been in this series. What I mean is I've learned more how to teach the Old Testament because what I'm doing, and I hope you can appreciate this, I'm taking Old Testament shadows. The, the Scripture says the law. The law is the Old Testament. The law having a shadow. Having a shadow of good things to come. Now, we think of the law as being Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That was officially called the law among the Jews, but all the rest of the Old Testament is the law. It goes by the term law and the prophets. Law and the prophets. So wherever you find a prophet speaking and he says something that's true, you're going to find a lot of definitions for the law that's not in the first five books of the Bible. That's called law, or it's called, among the Jews, it's called Torah. Torah is not Talmud. Remember, Talmud was that corruption of the law. In fact, Talmud is a corruption of Torah. Torah is good, Talmud is bad. <coughs> this was the verbal law of the Jews. Verbal law, not the law, but the verbal law, where they had perverted the law when they were carried away into Babylon, into Babylon, and the and the rabbis that went to Babylon, uh, or the the priesthood that went to Babylon they called themselves rabbis in Babylon and they perverted the law when they translated over into that Aramaic Babylonian language uh, what is correct is the Torah uh, we call the Torah Pentateuch and everything Thomas bad that's that verbal law and this law is more than just the Torah or the Pentateuch, which is, Pent means five. Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. This is what the Jews called the law. But when the Bible speaks of the law and the prophets over in the New Testament, it's talking about the entire inspired Word of God. We believe all of the Old Testament is the inspired Word of God. And everything in the Old Testament was built around a particular bloodline. It was, the promise was to a bloodline. Of course, it started with Adam, and it goes, and what we're doing, we're working our way through the Bible. It starts with Adam, and then it goes down through Noah, and then his son Shem, and that takes us down, him and his son lineage, go down to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph ends up in Egypt, is sold into Egypt, and they stay there 400 years, and then they come out in Exodus. Uh, Exodus, the 12th chapter, that's the Passover, the death of the firstborn in Egypt. And then we've worked our way, and what I'm learning to do is to take the Old Testament culture and customs, culture, now, this is about a family lineage, and it's about their method of worship, which is temple, tabernacle. It starts off with tabernacle, and then it will become Herod's temple. So the, the tabernacle, the same exact dimension was built, well, not Herod's temple, excuse me, into Solomon's temple, Solomon's temple, which after it is destroyed, the temple is rebuilt under the Persian Empire by decrees from the Persian king Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, and it's rebuilt, and when it's rebuilt, it exists into the time of Jesus 
when he goes out and looks at the temple and says the time will come when one stone will not be left upon another, this rebuilding of the temple, uh, that is, that is uh, called the second temple. And the first temple is Solomon's temple. This is the first temple. And actually, the first method of worship would be the tabernacle. This would be one. This is actually, in reality, be two. And this would be three. And then, of course, that temple, Herod's temple, which was rebuilt under these Persian decrees, was destroyed in 70 A.D. Uh, after the death of Christ. So, I'm learning to take Oh, take New Testament and take everything that I can in the New Testament and even things in the Old Testament and go back and teach the things that were going on over here by matching it up with events of Old Testament and New Testament. And I'll show you some of that tonight. And the method of worship for this family, this is a family chosen by God, just like He's chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. And they worshiped in a literal temple or a tabernacle in the wilderness. And uh, the tabernacle had a veil and an ark of the covenant. And we've already said that this is a picture of us. We're the tabernacle of God. We are His temple. No, you're not your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. A tabernacle in the Greek means one that is useful to the husband, and that's the church, the wife, the bride of Christ. And you had in this, you had the altar of incense, and you had the seven candlesticks and the table of showbread. You had the brazen sea and the uh, brazen altar, the altar. And we've already gone through all this and said this was all a type of the church. The ark was like it was a type of our hearts because the law was written on tables of stone. And now it's written on facial tables of our heart and it was kept inside the ark of the covenant and that's our hearts. And, and this altar of incense is the prayers of the saints in Revelation 4 and 5. And we are the bread. We being many are one bread and one body. That's the table of showbread. And this is a picture and a type. The, the candlesticks is a picture and a type of the refined church. And the, this brazen sea was a picture of the blood baptism of Christ. All the priests had to be washed there. And this brazen altar is a picture of the cross. Not only Christ's cross, but our daily cross. Now, we're talking about how that God came to Moses and he gave him. And what I'm going to do is to try to show you how this is tied to Old and New Testament. That this, as you go along, God's going to give, give us some instruction about the law. And it's going to tie with, uh, it's going to tie up with, I'll be giving you laws in Exodus. And it will tie up with events in first second samuel first and second kings and first and second chronicles as soon as god implements a law it comes into effect now we've worked our way over to the 25th chapter of exodus that's after moses leads the children of israel out of egypt and where they are, they're over here in, in the, uh, this Arabian Peninsula. They're somewhere in this area here. Uh, and I believe that the Mount Sinai is down in the southern part of that Sinai Peninsula. Now, they're over here, and God is giving Moses instruction concerning that temple. Now, I want us to go back where we left off, over here in... in uh, Exodus, the 25th chapter. We went through Exodus 25. We studied God's instruction on building. Uh, he starts off with instructions to build the tabernacle in the 25th chapter of Exodus. And then he goes on to building the uh, 
building the uh, the brazen altar. Now, excuse me, not the brazen altar. The Ark of the Covenant. That would be the first thing he wants to build. And then he gives instructions on building the mercy seat, starting in verse 17. That ends down in verse 22. And then he speaks of building the uh, table of showbread, starting in the next verse, in verse 23. And then he goes on down through verse 30. And in verse 31, he starts on the instructions to building the candlesticks. And he goes on through there. Then he starts giving the instructions for building the tabernacle, and we went through most of that, all that we're going to go through in chapter 26. I want to go to the altar, this altar, and how it ties in not only with Old Testament, but with New. There's some particular things about this brazen altar that you need to notice. So here is... Here is the tabernacle. This is the place of worship. The Levites were the priesthood of this tabernacle. And you had a high priesthood, high priesthood, that comes out of Levi through the lineage of Aaron. I'm not going to go into all the details. So to be a high priest, you had to be a son of Aaron, and he was a Levite. Levi was the third son of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel uh, there in the 32nd chapter of Genesis. Now, we're talking about this tabernacle. We've already covered a lot about the, the rest of the furniture. And... We're going to talk about this this brazen altar right here. I've done some study on it. They say it was po possibly, they didn't know much about alloys back then, but they would heat up zinc and copper, and they believe it came out of zinc and copper, that it was an alloy. They didn't know anything about steel back then. An alloy is two or more metals mixed together. And they think it may have been copper. Now, when I say they think, copper and zinc, when I say they think, there's a lot to be understood about the fact that we've lost the meaning of a lot of the colors, of a lot of the numbers, and of a lot of the... Uh, uh, these uh, metals in the Old Testament. But these were made of brass. All these in here were beaten gold. Now, I want us to go over here to the 27th chapter of Exodus. This is instructions on building the altar here. Now, the priest on duty they would eat this showbread. They may be on duty for two weeks. They came out of the two families. Aaron had four sons. Aaron was a Levite. And Aaron had four sons. Nadab, Abihu, and Eleazar, and Ithamar. And Nadab and Abihu did something that displeased God to the point that he killed them. They offered strange fire on this altar right here, on that golden altar. They offered strange fire and God killed them before they had any children. So they didn't have any children to carry on their part of the priesthood. All of the priesthood will be carried on by Ithamar and Eleazar, and they had 24 sons. And David appointed those 24 sons officially to be the high priesthood of Israel. And we know that during the time of David, Zadok, Zadok and 
A-B-I-A-T-H-A-R. Now, Zadok had come, he had been the high priest under Saul, and before David had gained all the kingdom, Abiathar was the was the high priest under David. So when David became the king of all of Israel in Second Samuel, when he becomes the king of all of Israel, he keeps Zadok, who's a righteous man, along with Abiathar as the high priest, and David ends up with two high priests. In fact, both of these guys had a son. Both of these had a son, and they were supposed to be the two fastest running men in Israel. And it was these two men, whenever David's son Absalom was slain by Joab, David's nephew, who was his commanding general, when he was slain, it was these two sons of these two men that uh, that ran and took the message to David. And we'll get into that later. I need to get on back to the lesson. Now, I want us to read here in chapter 27, verse 1. Thou shalt make an altar. This is the altar he's talking about right here. What is the shadow of this altar over here in the New Testament? It's the cross. It's the cross. Now, these priests on duty, they had, they had bread and steak for dinner. They ate this showbread, and they had what they called a flesh hook. And it was three prongs. And they would take this flesh hook, whatever sacrifice they were offering that day, and this is the meat, if it was beef, if, it were, if they were consecrating the priesthood of Israel, they'd pull this, reach down in that, into that, uh, this, into this sacrifice, and whatever they pulled up, that's what they would get to eat with their bread. So the bread is a picture of the church. And when the Bible speaks of, we, we speak of uh, sacrifice and oblation. Well, the oblation was the bread offering that was with the sacrifice. So, when you have a sacrifice and oblation, you have sacrifice and bread. Our sacrifice is a daily cross. We offer our bodies a living sacrifice. And the bread we eat of is this Word of God. Now, I want us to... Thou shalt make an altar of sheet and wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. A cubit is the length is the estimated length from the king's elbow to the tip of his finger. Approximately a foot and a half. So this is five cubits would be seven and a half foot square. That's about the height of this ceiling, maybe a little shorter. These are eight foot ceilings, I believe. So you take just about the height of this ceiling square. That's how big this this uh, altar was five cubits by five cubits the altar shall be four square it means four sided now we're going to hit this word four square often in the old testament you're also going to find it in revelation the 21st chapter talking about the heavenly jerusalem that comes down out of heaven which is the church it's going to be four square it's going to be four sided and they said that the earth had four sides. It had four winds, an east wind, a west wind, a north wind, and a south wind. So when they said four square in the New Testament, it meant all over the world because four square included the world the way they saw it. Now, let me get me a drink of water here. All right. I want us to look over here in... Ezekiel, what did Ezekiel call this altar? Ezekiel 41. Here's what he called it. Ezekiel 
Ezekiel 41. Here's what he called it. Ezekiel 41 and verse 22. The altar of wood was three cubits high. Now this is Ezekiel's altar. This is Ezekiel's altar. This is spiritual Israel he's talking about here. And the length thereof two cubits, and corners thereof, and the length thereof, and the walls thereof were of wood. And he said, This is the table that is before the Lord. Now the table is where the, they ate from. Look over here in Ezekiel 44. I'm not going to get into teaching about this spiritual tabernacle here. This the last part of Ezekiel is about the church. That's what it's about. And then you, in uh, Ezekiel 44 and verse 15, But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that keep the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me and to offer me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord, and they shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near my table to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. Now, this is partaking of the table of the Lord. It's not, the table of the Lord is not crackers and grape juice. That's not what it is. It's God's altar. It's, I believe he's talking about all of his altars here because the table of God would be partaking of this. It would be partaking of this Ark of the Covenant. Now, I want us to, I want to show you something else. I want you to go back to the 27th verse, 27th chapter, and I'm going to try to cover some things here that, that goes with the history. Now, we're going to, while I'm going through this, first and second, Samuel, first and second Kings, and first and second Chronicles. Now this is the time period that Israel is a nation. Now in first and second Samuel, they do not have a temple. And they don't actually have a tabernacle. They end the tabernacle service when they come out of the wilderness. And they go through a time period in first and second, actually, actually in Judges and first and second Samuel and first and second Kings and first and second Chronicles. They go through a time period, well, not in Kings and Chronicles. They go through a time period in Judges and in First and Second Samuel, that they don't have a temple or a tabernacle. They're keeping the Ark of the Covenant in a tent because David is the king during Second Samuel. Saul is the king from First Samuel. Well, he's the king in the eyes of the people from First Samuel, the first chapter, all the way through that 31st chapter of First Samuel. But in the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel, God appoints David king over Saul, even though Saul is ruling all through 1 Samuel in the eyes of the people. David is God's king from the 16th chapter to the end of the book as far as God is concerned. Then, when you get to, you go through 2 Samuel, David is the king of all of Israel. Why don't they have a temple in Second Samuel because David is a man of blood. He is a man of war. And God says, you cannot build a tabernacle for me. I'm going to have your son do that. Now, his son that builds the temple will be Solomon. 
Now Solomon was the son of Bathsheba, the woman that David committed adultery with, and that son died, and this and in the future she has a son, Solomon, and he's given the charge to build the temple of God, and he does that in First Kings. First Kings. And we'll get into that along the way. In fact, we're going to get into some of the things that happened in First Kings concerning this altar. I want to look at some of the... He says in verse 2, Thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horn shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. Now the horns of this altar... They are for many different things. I'm going to read a couple of things to you about the horns of the altar. I want to look here at chapter 29, verse 12. Now, you had horns on this altar and on this altar. Those horns, they weren't that long. They were small compared to it. And any time you see pictures, there'll be just like little horns on there. They actually tied the sacrifice down on the altar uh, at these horns. I don't know how they did it. I don't think anybody knows how. So they tied it down. Now, where was I going? Oh, I want to look here at some of these that where the Bible mentions these horns. Look here in 29 and 12. 29 and 12. And thou shalt take of the blood of the bullock. Now, this is for the priest's office. If you'll notice, he's talking about the priesthood all through here. And he's talking about the temple in chapter uh, 20, 27. He's talking about the altar. He's talking about, he starts chapter 28 with all the things for the priesthood. He's going to have the priesthood anointed in chapter 28. He's going to instruct that they receive the ephod and the robe and the breastplate and the broidered coat and the mitre and the girdle. And he's going to tell you all about what the priests are going to wear and how they're going to be anointed all through this chapter and through the next chapter. They're going to be anointed in chapter 29. Now, he, I'm going to show you what these horns are for. Go over here to uh, chapter 29, verse 12. Let me back up a little. Uh, look at verse 4. Aaron and his son shall bring into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shall wash them with water, and thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and ephod, and gird him with the curious girdle of the ephod. Now, all of those things, the breastplate and the ephod, you're going to find all those listed in verse 4 of chapter 28. In in verse 4 of chapter 28. And you'll take all of this and place it upon Aaron, and thou shalt put the mitre upon his head. Now, the mitre was a strap that went around his head. And put the holy crown upon the mitre. That's very important right there. The holy crown, this mitre was a strap that went around their head, and there's a crown upon this mitre. Now, I've talked about this so many times. In fact, gosh, I've got so many places to go. This kind of sets up how this crown was wore. There'll be a crown. What verse was I in? Huh? Six. Thou shalt put the mitre upon his head and put the holy crown upon the mitre. There is a crown upon the high priest's head. Boy, there has been so much mistake about this out of Revelation, the fourth chapter. This connects with Revelation 4 because if you go back to the previous chapter 28, and he says, Thou shalt make a plate of pure gold in verse 36, and grave upon it like the gravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. 
This is the golden crown mentioned over here in verse 6 that goes up on the mitre. A mitre is a strap around the head. Uh, and grave upon it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on blue lace, that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be, and it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things, which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts, and it shall be always upon his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord. So when he says in verse 6 of chapter 29, Thou shalt put the mitre upon his head, and put the holy crown upon the mitre. There's been a drastic mistake among the so-called evangelicals, Bible-believing churches, out of the out of the fourth chapter of Revelation. Look at that. This is what's on the forehead of the high priest. Well, when you get to the New Testament, no, you no longer have high priests, do you? You have one high priest. And that's Jesus, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. But when you get over here to Revelation, the fourth chapter, Revelation 4. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and read the first part of it. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, as it were, as of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, and the throne of God was called, that's what the Ark of the Covenant was called. So in this throne of God, this is our hearts, and we are the temple of God. And the high priest is Melchizedek. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. That's the twenty-four elders, sons of Ithamar and Eleazar. You find that in the twenty-fourth chapter of First Chronicles. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting and clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. How many elders were there in the Old Testament? Twenty-four families, and they had upon the head crowns of gold. That's what it's talking about, the sixth verse of the 29th chapter of Exodus. They had a mitre upon their head and put the holy crown upon the mitre Backing up to verse 36 of chapter 28 of Exodus, And thou shalt make a plate or a crown of pure gold, engrave upon it like the engravings of a signet to holiness to the Lord. So, I've said this a lot of times, but I don't know if I've really made it clear. And out of the throne proceeds lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Well, the seven lamps are the seven candlesticks in its front of the throne of God. Right there. Now, I'm not going to read all this chapter because I've got a lot of places to go. So we go down here and we see that Christ is sitting upon the throne here. And he goes on down here to say, verse 10. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Now this is what he's saying. He's saying these 24 families back here, this is very figurative language. They all have upon their heads crowns, of gold with a mitre that says holiness to the Lord and they're casting their crowns at the feet of Christ who is upon the throne of our hearts saying we are not worthy to judge the hearts of these people in the New Testament holy Jerusalem 
We're not, we're not worthy to do that. This is what this is talking about. It's talking about these crowns back here in... You're not going to find anywhere in the New Testament where the Christians, Christians, have crowns of gold are these pointed crowns, these pointed crowns, they don't have these pointed crowns. That is, those are a type of the horns of Nimrod. That's an evil crown. The common word crown. Now, I don't know if a lot of you are familiar with this, but people, these preachers will get in the pulpits in these Baptist churches and say, we're going to go, when we get to heaven, we're going to cast our crowns at his feet. We're not going to have anything like these crowns, it's not... When they say we're going to cast our crowns at His feet, they're taking these things, this concept out of Revelation, the fourth chapter. We're not going to cast our crowns anywhere. We're not going to have any kind of crowns other than a Stephanos. And Stephanos is the word crown. The common word translated crown, we get the word Stephanie or the name Stephanie or Stephen from this. And what that was was an oak leaf that everyone who participated in the games got this. When we participate in the games or this race that we run for Christ, that's, that's the crowns that we're going to receive. In fact, the Bible speaks of, look over here in 1 Corinthians 9. Look at this. I'm just going to show you these things, show you what kind of a crown we're going to have. 1 Corinthians 9. nine and verse Let's read in verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all. You run the whole race. And all of us are running a race for Christ. And Paul is using terminology out of the games that they ran in the Colosseum or in the Agon, as that picture over there shows. He says, They that run the race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, this is terminology out of the games that they ran there at Corinth. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible Stephanos. But we, an incorruptible. If we're going to have an incorruptible crown, it's not going to be material. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so beat I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Dulagogeo. Lest that by any means, it means to enslave myself. Lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself become a castaway. And the word castaway is the word adokimas, A-D-O-K-I-M-A-S. It's the same word as reprobate. Reprobate. It means no trials, no fire. Dokimas means to be tested or go through the fire of the trials, placing the alpha in front of dokimos, it translates reprobate, or that was a type of silver that didn't go through the fire. So when you reprobate, you don't like the fire. And then he says, I become reprobate, lest by any man means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Let me give you another thing on the crown. Look at Philippians 4. Our crowns are one another. We don't walk around with people on our head, do we? No. Now, Paul says here to Philippians 4 and 1. 4 and 1. Therefore, my brethren, talking to the people at Philippi, dearly beloved, long for my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. 
Paul said his crown was the Philippians at Philippi that were believers reading these words. He said, you're my crown. And then he says in 1 Thessalonians 2, look at 1 Thessalonians 2. What I'm trying to do is really verify this so that you can see we're not going to throw any crowns at Jesus' feet. Not gold crowns. We're going to give him glory and credit for everything. Look here, flip, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye... Aren't you our crown in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? You will be my crown, Thessalonians. Look over here in in Second uh, Timothy four. Second Timothy four. You're not going to find any of these gold crowns that we're going to cast anywhere. Second Timothy four. And no, this is First Timothy. I was in the wrong place. Second Timothy four, verse eight. Paul says in verse seven, "I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course." He's speaking in athletic terms of competing in the games in the Agon. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, and it's not made of gold or any material thing, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. Now look over here. That's a crown of righteousness. Look at James 1. James 1. And verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, we're tried here on earth, aren't we? He shall receive the crown of life. When they wore crowns, that showed who they served. When we see the Babylonian harlot in Revelation 17 and 5, upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots. A harlot would wear a band around her head with an inscription saying, Who she served. And this is a, this Babylonian harlot is a world system of religious serving Babylon or the Let Us Make Us a Name system. And look over here in uh, we did we finish that? Yeah, crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love Him, and we receive that while we're here. Then look over here in First Peter five. First Peter five and verse four. First Peter five. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. It doesn't sound like this is literal material, is it? It's not material. We get a crown of glory. And when you go to Revelation 2, Revelation 2, And verse 10. And none of these things which thou shalt suffer, talking to this church here at Smyrna, none of, fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried... And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. 
I believe that 10 days is a very figurative term. I have not studied it in detail. But I believe it's figurative because everything else in the text is figurative. 10 was a complete number. And then when you look at Revelation 3, Revelation 3, verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown, thy stephanos. And look at Revelation 6 and 2. 6 and 2. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That's a stephanos. And you go into 12.1, he speaks of this woman having a crown on her head, and then you go into 14 and 14, uh, having a golden crown. Now, I want us to go back over here. I've got some things I want us to read to see about this altar. Go back to... Go back to Exodus... The twenty seventh chapter. So Jim, we are your crown. That's right. And I am your crown. We are crowned to one another. Crowns show who we serve. That's what they do. That's what a crown was for. It was to show the authority of a king, and that's the king that we serve. That's true. Then he now I want us to go back over here. He made the horns upon the four corners thereof of his horns in verse two. Four corners thereof, his horn shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. Now, this is this altar out here with these horns. Now, it was said among the Jews that if a man had committed a crime, if he had committed a crime or he had committed some sin, he could go get a hold of the horns of this altar and he couldn't be touched unless that sin was murder. Now, where, where they come up and get this is out of Exodus 21 and 14. Go back to Exodus 21, 14. 21, 14. Well, let's read 12 down through 14. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. And if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor, presumptuously is what we would call premeditated murder, planned to slay him with guile, orma, trickery. Guile is the word orma. If the man plans to kill another man by tricking him into being someplace so he can jump on him and murder him, thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. So if a man could grab these horns... Unless he was a murderer, he could have sanctuary until some later date till someone could come and take him before the judges. But if he was a murderer, you could take him off the altar and he died. Now you have this, you have a couple of illustrations of this and I want us to go over there and look at it. Let's go over here to 1 Kings. 1 Kings. Now, there's two men that went and grabbed hold of the horns of this altar. One was Joab, David's nephew, David's commander, his commanding general in 1 Kings. Now, what's happening in 1 Kings? Remember I told you a while ago that David was the king in 2 Samuel. 
And David is an old man at the end of Second Samuel. He's an old king. When you move into Second Kings, you move into David stepping down. And David said these words there in the first part of First Kings. He said, I go the way of all the earth. David said, I am about to die. Now, there's this fight going on with David's kids. David had many children. He had many wives. In fact, if you go over here to the third chapter of Second Samuel, we'll see a list of David's wives and some of the children he had. Chapter 3, Second Samuel. Now, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. What does it mean, the house of Saul? Here we are in Second Samuel, the third chapter. Third chapter. What does it mean, the house of David and the house of Saul? Because Saul died in that last chapter, in the 31st chapter of 1 Samuel. 31st chapter. 31st chapter, 1 Samuel. Saul dies. He's at Mount Gilboa. And he falls upon his sword. Falls upon his sword. He has some assistance from a young man coming by. He says, fall upon me and kill me. I don't want to fall in the hands of my enemy because they'll torture me. So Saul is, his kingdom is over, but David is ruling southern Israel. And he's not fully the commander of northern Israel yet. Who's handling northern Israel since Saul died? No, you'd think that, wouldn't you? His commanding general, Abner. And Abner is ruling the house of Saul. Now, Abner knows that he doesn't have legal right to that, but he wields kind of a free hand the way he wants to. And he's Saul has a son named Ish. Basheth. Basheth is a poor excuse for a leader. Just, just worth not hardly anything. And we'll talk about Ishbosheth later. But eventually, Abner. Oh gosh, I don't need to get into all that. <laughs> Abner is going to be killed by Joab, David's nephew. Boy, that starts something unbelievable. But Abner comes up and takes one of Ishbosheth, the surviving son of a king, is supposed to get all the wives and and the concubines. They all belong to the surviving king. Well, look here in the third chapter of Second Samuel. I'm going to go through all of this when we teach through the books of the kings. Now, here in Second Samuel, third chapter, there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but the house of Saul was being ruled by Abner, his commanding general. But David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And unto David was born, were sons born in Hebron. And David's firstborn was Amnon. Amnon. You remember I've talked about Amnon? Amnon was the one who raped his sister Tamar. And all this took place after David had Uriah the Hittite killed because 
he like Uriah's wife, which was Bathsheba, which was his chief counselor, Hithophel's daughter, granddaughter. Goodness, this thing gets into the young and restless, doesn't it? <laughs> All right. Amnon's was David's oldest son. And Tamar was David's daughter. Now, we're going to get into all of this. I really am trying to get to the horns of the altar. But uh, I've got to say something about David's children to show what happens in 1 Kings. Now, look here. Let's finish up this here. David, unto David was born in Hebron. His first one was Amnon. Of Ahinoam, Ahinoam was his wife, one of his wives, the Jezreelitess. And the second born of David was Kiliab. C-H-I-L-E-A-B. This is David's second born, second son. We don't know. We don't hear much about him, and his mother was Abigail, the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. Now we'll talk about Nabal and how David took his wife, Abigail, because Nabal was very rebellious against David the king, and Nabal had to die, the Carmelite, and the third born of David was Absalom. This is the one he has so much trouble with, Absalom. We're going to go through all these characters when we go through this. It was Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai. Now, Absalom uh, dies at the end of this book right here. And the fourth was Adonijah. Now, Adonijah, this was the third... When David dies, Adonijah thinks that he has a right to the kingdom because he is the surviving oldest son. So he thinks he gets a right to the kingdom. And this is where we come into these horns of the altar. And the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, and the fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Abitil, and the sixth, Ithraim, by Eglah, David's wife, these were born to David in Hebron. But Solomon, David has not uh, had his affair with Bathsheba yet, and that baby that she becomes pregnant with dies, and then later on she has Solomon, and David promises Solomon that he's going to build the throne, and he's going to bypass any of these sons and give the kingdom to Solomon. And that's what happens over here in 1 Kings, the first chapter. Go back to 1 Kings. Now, if you'll notice here, David is old and stricken in years, and they covered him with clothes, but he couldn't get warm. He's old. In the previous chapter was where David... In uh, the last chapter of Second Samuel, where David was numbering Israel and taking credit for all of his uh, glorious victories, and we see that in that twenty-fourth chapter of Second Samuel, David numbers Israel and God punishes him for that. Well, you get over here; he kills seventy thousand people, innocent people in Israel, for David numbering Israel, and God is the one that provoked him to number him. Now, that's the sovereignty of God. So David is old. He's an old man in 1 Kings, the first chapter. Now, David has promised Solomon's mother Bathsheba in the presence of Nathan the prophet that Solomon would be king. Solomon is going to build the temple, an exact replica of the tabernacle in the wilderness. Stricken in years, he was stricken in years, they covered him with clothes, and he got no heat. Wherefore his servants said unto him, Let there be sought for my lord the king a young virgin, 
Let her stand before the king and let her cherish him and let her lie in thy bosom that my lord the king may get heat. So they sought for a fair damsel throughout all the coast of Israel and found Abishag. Now her name may not sound pretty to us, but she was beautiful because all the men wanted her, particularly Adonijah wanted her. A Shunammite and brought her to the king and the damsel was very fair and cherished the king and ministered to him but the king knew her not he did not have sexual relations with her he was an old man knew her not meant to have sexual relations then Adonijah fourth born son of David in that chapter there that we read it's that third chapter of second Samuel he assumes the position I'm going to be king then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. Remember I told you that in Israel, when a guy became king, there'd be 50 soldiers to run in front of his chariot. He just assumes the throne without David's say-so and without David's okay. I'm the surviving eldest son. Uh, these other sons of David are dead the older ones I get to be the king Adonijah the son of Haggith exalted himself saying I will be king well, that's a lot of brass isn't it? and he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him and his father had not displaced, displeased him at any time in saying why hast thou done so so David never went to him and said why are you doing this he also had a very goodly man, was a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. And he conferred with Joab. Now, Absalom is dead at this point. Joab has killed him. And Absalom, uh, Absalom, Adonijah goes and confers with Joab, his cousin. Joab is the son of Abigail, David's sister. Abigail. Joab. And Abishai. Are David's sister's sons. And. Let me see if this is right. Abishai. And Abishai was David's constant companion. And Joab was David's commander. David's commander. Now, uh, oh, excuse me, I had one other. They also had a brother, A-S-A-H-E-L, Asahel. But Asahel was killed by Joab, uh, by, excuse me, Abner. Well, I'm getting these guys mixed up, ain't I? He was killed by Abner, and we'll get into that later. And this is the family. Uh, this is all one big happy family. Now, so he conferred with Joab. This is Adonijah conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar the priest, and they followed Adonijah to help him. Now, you've got to remember, Abiathar had been the, the son, he, had, he was the son of Ahimelech. Who was, a pri who was the high priest that Saul came in while he was chasing David and he had Ahimelech and 85 high priests of God killed, murdered by a man named Doeg who was not an Israelite, he was an evil, wicked man, and he murdered these at the behest of Saul, the king of Israel. Well, this is amazing because Abiathar's life was spared by David. Abiathar. I'm sorry I'm giving you so much confusion. Abiathar was spared by David and set up in the office of high priest 
high priest. So what Abiathar is doing is defecting to Adonijah. He defects to Adonijah's side and he's going to side with him. And, but Zadok the priest, Zadok was also of the sons of Aaron. Zadok the priest and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and Nathan the prophet and Shemai and Rei the mighty men which belonged to David were not with Adonijah. They didn't follow him. And Adonijah slew sheep and oxen and fat cattle by the stone of Zaheleth, which is by Enrogel, and all and called all his brethren, the sons, the king's sons, and the men of Judah, the king's servants, but Nathan the prophet and Beniah, and the mighty men, these super soldiers of David. And Solomon and his brother, he didn't call. And this is when Nathan and Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, in verse 14, they go to David and they're saying, Hast thou heard? Or this is what Nathan spake unto Bathsheba. Have you heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, uh, has set himself up to reign and David, our Lord, doesn't know it? And David is still alive and still the king. And Adonijah sounds like he's going to try to overthrow the kingdom just like Absalom did before he was killed in the previous book. Therefore come, let me, pray, let me, I pray thee, give thee counsel that thou mayest save thine own life and the life of thy son. Go and get thee unto King David and tell David, you swore that Solomon would be king. You need to live by your word. I'm just going to give you a little bit of what he says, what they say here. And Bathsheba went unto the king into the chamber, and the king was old. And Abishag the Shunammite ministered unto the king. And Bathsheba bowed. This is verse 16. And did obeisance unto the king. And the king said, What do you want? What would you do? What would you that I do for you? She said, My lord, thou swearest by the Lord thy God unto thine handmaid, saying, Assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. And now behold, Adonijah is reigning as king in Israel. He's not even official. He hasn't been crowned king. And now, my lord, the king, thou knowest it not, and he hath slain oxen and fat cattle and sheep in abundance, and hath called all the sons of the kings, and Abiathar the priest, and Joab the captain of the host. Now, Joab is being treacherous also. He is David's nephew. Adonijah is, for, is his first cousin. And thou, and thou, my Lord, O King, the eyes of all, my, uh, all Israel are upon thee, that thou shouldest tell them who shall sit on the throne and my Lord the King after him. Otherwise it shall come to pass when my Lord the King shall sleep with his fathers that I and my son Solomon shall be counted offenders to the court, to the king's court, if you let this happen. And lo, while she talked with the king, Nathan the prophet also came in. And they told the king, saying, Behold, Nathan the prophet, and when he was come in before the king, he bowed down before King David with his face to the ground. And Nathan said to the king, O Lord, O king, my lord, O king, Hast thou said, Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit on the throne? For he has gone down today and has slain oxen and fat and cattle and sheep in abundance. He's going to have a big festival and hath given all the king's sons and the captains of the host and a beer to the priest. And behold, they eat and drink before him and, God, and says, God save King Adonijah. But me, even me, thy servant Zadok the priest, and Benai the son of Jehoiada, and thy servant Solomon, hath he not called? Is this thing done by my lord the king? Did you do this, king? This is Nathan the prophet talking to him. And thou hast not showed it unto thy servant, who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? Then king David answered and said, Nathan, prophet, Get Bathsheba and come in here. Get me Bathsheba. And she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swore and said, As the Lord liveth that hath redeemed my soul out of all distress, 
even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne, and in my stead, even so will I certainly do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth, and did reverence to the king, and said, Let my lord King David live forever. And King David said, Call me Zadok the priest. Don't get a Beathor the priest. He is on Adonijah's side. And Nathan the prophet and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. Now Benaiah is going to become the commanding general of Solomon. And he is a bad dude. About as bad as you can get. And they came before the king, and the king said unto them, Take with you the servant of your Lord, and cause Solomon my son to rise, to ride upon mine own mule, and bring him down to Gihon. All the kings rode upon a, a donkey, because they were sure-footed, and they wouldn't fall. That's why Jesus came into, into Jerusalem on the young colt of an ass. It was, it, he was certainly coming in humility, but as a humble king. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint David their king over Israel and blow you the trumpet, uh, excuse me, and anoint Solomon and say, blow you the trumpet and say, God save King Solomon. Then ye shall come up after him that he may come and sit upon my throne for he shall be king in my stead, not this Adonijah. And I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. Then Benaiah the son of Jehoiada answered the king and said, Amen, the Lord God of my the Lord God of my Lord the king say so too. And as the Lord hath been with my Lord the king, even so he will be with Solomon, make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord King David. So Zadok, the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and the Carathites are the lifeguards, that's what they were, and the Pelathites, the, the official messengers, went down and caused Solomon to ride upon David's mule and brought him to Gihon. And Zadok the priest took an horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon and blew the trumpet. And all the people said, God save King Solomon. Whoa, Adonijah's in trouble. He thinks he's going to be the king. He thinks you can just assume this throne by your own free will, and you can. And all the people came up after him, and the people piped with pipes, rejoiced with great joy, so that the earth rent with the sound of them. And Adonijah and all the guests that were with him heard this noise and this racket. God save King Solomon. And they had made an end of eating. And when Joab heard the sound of the trumpet, he said, What is this noise of the city being in an uproar? And Joab has gone and sided with Adonijah. And while he yet spake, behold, Jonathan, the son of Abiathar, the priest, came and Adonijah said unto him, Come in, for thou art a valiant man, and bring us good tidings. And Jonathan answered and said to Adonijah, Verily our Lord King David hath made Solomon king. Adonijah is sweating bullets. And the king hath sent with him Zadok the priest, and, jo and Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and the Carathites and the Pelathites, these messengers and lifeguards, bodyguards of David, and they have caused him to ride upon the king's mule, and Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, who are on David's side, have anointed him king in Gihon, and they are come up from thence rejoicing, so that the city rang again. This is the noise that you have heard, Solomon is king. Also Solomon sitteth on the throne of the kingdom. Moreover, the king, 
The king's servant came to bless our Lord King David, saying, God, make the name of Solomon better than thy name and make his throne greater than thy throne. And the king bowed himself upon the bed. And also thus said the king, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which hath given me, given one to sit on the throne this day, mine eyes even seeing it. And the guests that were with Adonijah were afraid and rose up, and they all took off and went their own way. And Adonijah feared because of Solomon and arose and went and caught hold on the horns of the altar. Save my life. Now that's where this all you've got two places where the horns of the altar are grass. Both of them are in this story. Adonijah that we know of wasn't a murderer. Joab was a murderer. He was a killer. He's a dangerous man. How how much time do they have, Mike? All right. Adonijah took hold of the horns of the altar, and it was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah feareth King Solomon. I guess so. And for lo, he hath caught hold on the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear unto me today that he will not slay his servant with the sword. And Solomon said, If you prove to be a worthy man, there shall not a hair of him fall to the earth. But if wickedness shall be found in him, he's going to die. So King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar, and he came and bowed himself to King Solomon. And Solomon said unto him, Go to thine house. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. And David, I don't want to continue in this story here because David dies at this point. In verse, I'll just read, read about his death. He gives some instructions and it, the Scripture says in well, let me read a little bit of this. Now, he's got some instructions about Shimei. This is the man who threw stones at him. Says, if he behaves himself, I won't kill Solomon. You don't kill him either. Well, he leaves Shimei and Joab in the hands of Solomon. And David dies. Now, therefore, verse 9, do not hold Shimei guiltless. For thou art a wise man, and knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him. But his forehead, his gray hair, will bring him down to the grave with blood. Verse 10, So David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the days that David reigned over Israel were forty years. Seven years reigned he in Hebron, and thirty-three years reigned he in Jerusalem. And David is a picture of Jesus. Jesus was 33 when he died, and seven is the number of refinement. Now, Solomon is the, is the king. Look at verse 19. Bathsheba therefore went unto King Solomon to speak unto him for Adonijah. Because Adonijah has asked for something. In verse 13, Adonijah the son of Agath came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. He said, You know this Abishag, this woman, that was this beautiful woman that was brought to my father David to give him warmth. Can I have her? This was an act of rebellion because all of the wives of the previous king, all the concubines, belong to the incoming king. You're going to find that with Ishbosheth and Abner. Abner, when he was ruling northern Israel, he took one of the concubines of Saul and slept with her. 
and Ishbosheth Ish goes through the roof. But Abner was the powerful man in northern Israel. And he said, you're going to talk to me that way. I'll take your kingdom and give it to David. And that's when he goes to give it to David. And that's when Abner plots the death. I mean, uh, Joab plots the death of Abner. This is a, there is no soap opera like this. And this is the most astounding story. When I go through this, I'll go through it slow so we can pick up every detail of it. Uh, we're going to do this for long. Now, yeah. Now, what happens with Adonijah? Well, let's look and see. And she goes to, to Solomon. Bathsheba went to Solomon in verse 19. I came to speak to you for Adonijah. Then she says in verse 20, I, I desire one small petition of you, Solomon. And she's talking for Adonijah. Say me not, nay, don't tell me no. The king said unto her, Ask on my mother, for I will not say thee no. And she said, Let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah, thy brother to wife. He said, I'm not going to say no. I'm just going to kill him. And King Solomon answered and said unto his mother, Why are you asking Abishai the Shunammite for Adonijah? Why don't you just ask for the kingdom for him? Because that's the custom. Whoever gets to keep the concubines, they get to go, they get to be the king. Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is mine elder brother. He's my older brother. He thinks he's supposed to get the throne before me, but it was promised to me. Even for him, for Abiathar the priest and Joab the son of Zeruiah. Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, God do so to me, and more also, if Adonijah have not spoken this word against his own life. I said he had to behave himself, and he's not. That was a move towards assuming the throne, if you know the customs of these, the Jews in the ancient world. It was a backhand in Solomon's face. Now therefore, as the Lord liveth, which hath established me, and set me on the throne of David my father, who hath made me in house, as he promised Adonijah shall be put to death this day. And King Solomon sent by the hand of Benaiah, who's going to be his commander, the son of Jehoiada. And he fell upon Adonijah and he died. He killed him. Now. Yep, yeah, he got to thinking he got by with something is what he did. Now. I may, do I have any time? Now, he's got one more problem. He's actually got two problems. One is Shammai and the other is Joab. Let me read here. In verse 26, And unto Abiathar the priest said, The king get thee to Anathoth, unto thine own fields, for thou art worthy of death, Abiathar. I have spared your life. Because you were the surviving king of Ahimelech. Remember that over there in 22nd chapter of 1 Samuel. 22nd chapter of 1 Samuel. In the 22nd chapter, Saul is chasing David. David hasn't become king of Israel in the eyes of the people yet. This is just after Saul starts chasing him, trying to kill him, because Saul is the recognized king of Israel. And he comes to Ahimelech. Uh, he says, that, that you're going to die, Ahimelech. Well, he, he has Doeg kill four score and five persons, which were priests of God, there in verse 18. And then one of the sons of Ahimelech, verse 20, the son of Ahitub named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And he stuck with David. And because of this, 
he was the surviving son of the priesthood over here. Solomon thrust out Abiathar from being priest. He tells Abiathar in verse 26 of chapter 2 of First Kings, The priest said to the king, Get thee to Anathoth unto thine own fields, for thou art worthy of death. But I will not at this time put thee to death, because thou bearest the ark of the Lord God before David my father. And that's the only reason I'm sparing your life. He was backing Adonijah, wasn't he? He was going to be the high priest for Adonijah. And because thou hast been afflicted in all wherein my father was afflicted, and Solomon thrust out Abiathar from being priest unto the Lord, that he might fulfill the word of the Lord which he spake concerning the house of Shiloh. Then tidings came to Joab of Adonijah's death. And Solomon knows he's going to have trouble with Joab. And Joab fled into the tabernacle of the Lord and caught hold on the horns of the altar. He was a murderer. He's not getting by with this. If you think sanctuary is going to come to you taking hold of the horns of the altar, that's the horns of the altar in Exodus 27 and 1. And in the 21st chapter where if a man comes up against a man to kill him by premeditated murder, by presumptuously hiding and by trickery to kill him, that's premeditated murder. That man has to die. And Joab is guilty as sin. I could go through all the people he killed. He murdered Uriah the Hittite. It was at David's behest. David's one that told him. Uriah the Hittite took a note back to David after David had gotten Bathsheba pregnant and after Uriah wouldn't go home and sleep with his wife so David could, so everybody would think that was Uriah's baby. And then he sends Uriah in the heat of battle he says, uh, Joab put him in the heat of battle and withdraw from him so he'll be killed, and he was. So David committed adultery and murder. But Joab was his henchman. And David repents, and Joab doesn't have a repentant bone in his body. And David puts the word out, I want Joab dead. Now, I can go into all of these. He kid you were the Hittite killed. In Second Samuel the third chapter, Joab out and out murdered Abner and David and and David said he was a uh, he was a good man. And he was. And he murdered Abner, he murdered Absalom in the eighteenth chapter of of Second Samuel, and he murdered his cousin Amasa when, in that twentieth chapter of Second Samuel, when David tried to replace Joab, his nephew, with his other nephew Amasa, who was Abigail's son. Because he was a bloody man, he was a man of blood. And it was going to be Solomon that built the temple. And God tells him that. He says, you can't build it. You're a, you're a man of blood. Now, of course, he had murdered Uriah, Abner, Absalom, Amasa. Joab, even when he murdered Absalom and he came in from the battle and David was weeping and crying, he'd given instructions, don't anybody touch my son. Joab found him hanging in a tree by those long locks and he was alive. He just throw some they says darts, they were spears, he throwed them through it and murdered him. He was hanging there defenseless. Even though he was an honorary person, then Joab comes back to town where David is and said and David is weeping and crying, saying, Absalom, my son, my son and David is and and Joab is standing there looking at him and saying, What are you talking about? Weeping over your son Absalom. Don't you know he tried to take the kingdom from you? And Abner is sitting there chewing out David like he's a red-headed stepchild. Just like he didn't have good sense. Joab wasn't afraid of nobody. He was a killer. So guess what's going to happen to him? Solomon says, I'm not going to put up with this guy. And he grabs hold of the horns of the altar. And 
It's amazing what Benaiah says to him. Joab was a formidable foe. He was a fighter. He probably could have done good one-on-one -on -one with Benaiah. Benaiah was a... He killed some lion-like men. He was a super warrior, and so was Joab. I'd like to have seen him one-on-one -on -one in a in an arena. But Joab knew he didn't have a chance. He had the whole kingdom after him now. So Benaiah came to the tabernacle of the Lord... Solomon sent to Benai, the son of Jehoda, saying, Go fall upon him and kill him. Verse 30, Benai came to the tabernacle of the Lord and said unto him, Thus saith the king, Come forth. And he said, Nay, but I will die here. And Benai brought the king word again, saying, Thus said Joab, and thus he answered me. Joab says, I will die hanging on to the horns of this altar. And Benai says, I'll be glad to oblige you. You're going to die where you stand. The king said unto him, Do as he hath said, and fall upon him, and bury him, that thou mayest take away the innocent blood which Joab shed from me and from the house of my father. And the Lord shall return his blood upon his head, and who fell upon two men more righteous and better than he, and slew them with the sword. He's talking about Amasa and talking about Abner. And David, not knowing thereof to wit, Abner the son of Ner, captain of the host of Israel, and Amasa the son of Jether, captain of the host of Judah, their blood shall be therefore returned upon the head of Joab and upon the head of his seed forever. But upon David and upon his seed, upon his house and upon his throne, there shall be peace forever from the Lord. And Benai the son of Jehoiada went up and fell upon Joab and killed him. And he was buried in his own house in the wilderness. And this was while he's holding on to the horns of the altar. And the king put Je Benai, the son of Jehoiada, in his room over the host. He places, Solomon places Benaiah, this man who slew some lion-like men in battle, slew huge men. Benai was a great warrior but so was Joab Joab didn't have a chance he's holding on to those horns and that's it's over the whole the word has come out from the king this man is going to die and Zadok the priest did the king put in the room of Abiathar and Abiathar had to go home and start farming for a living I've run out of time at least we've seen what these horns were for they, they would tie down the sacrifice with these horns of the altar. Now, once in a while, when I get to going through these people, you'll have to forgive me. I, I'll get guys. I know I've got them twisted up, but I got them all right. I got them straightened out. As long as you don't put them on the ark. No, I ain't going to put them on the ark. I ain't going to do that. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Thank you for your word. Cause us to continue this work. We'll glorify you and praise you for all things. Lead us to your elect family. We'll give you praise for everything in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, wait a minute. I got something for you, don't I? Yeah, I forgot him. Um, I would have given to you earlier, but uh, okay. Well, fiddle, what I do with him? Uh, I wrote them all out. I, I think I hold on a second. <laughs>